As we continue in our study on the life and min earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, we took a look that he had been ministering during the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem and had left and was teaching and continuing to uh, answer questions of those who either had legitimate questions or sought to test him. And then we are come now to Luke chapter 10, verse starting with verse 38. And it says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. We're going to see uh, down the road that uh, this particular family, comprised of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, who were all siblings, become very close to Jesus. Uh, but this is our first introduction to this family. And so Martha, one of the siblings, uh, welcomes Jesus into her home. And verse 39, so she had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Now, Mary had decided that she was going to, in essence, take the role of a disciple. She was going to learn at Jesus' feet. That's oftentimes what disciples would do. And so she was doing more than just interested in the conversation. She was sitting at his feet, meaning that he's her teacher, he's her rabbi, and she's learning from him. Um, and so she's listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Now, this is so much like women, and I know I'm going to sound really chauvinistic and, and all that. But at least as far as my wife is concerned, when she's involved in preparations, she wants to get it done now. She'll always say, should we do something now or later? And I'm always saying later. And she's going, no, I want to do it now. And I went, well, why'd you ask me? And so she's very concerned with the preparations to make sure that everybody is going to have a seat. Everybody's going to have more than enough food and whatever. And so Martha is distracted. She's not paying attention to Jesus's teaching. And it's not that it's wrong in the sense of she's invited him as a guest. It's very much Middle Eastern culture as well as even in the West is that when you invite someone into your home, you're going to want them to feel welcome. And so she's going to want to make sure that he's provided for. And, and so with all these necessary preparations, it's like, well, my sister's just sitting there and she asked Jesus a question. Don't you care? My sister's not helping me. Now notice she doesn't even wait for a response. She doesn't say, well, do you or don't you? She's assuming that he does. Because immediately she says, well, then tell her to help me. So the option is, Jesus, since you care that I'm doing this alone, tell Mary to help me. Jesus has an interesting response. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Now, notice he says her name twice. Now, I don't know what her middle name is or was, and I don't even know if she had a middle name. In, in our culture, if, if someone were to say, Joseph Gary, then I know I'm in trouble because they use the middle name. But when you use the first name twice, it's usually not a rebuke. It's, okay, I got I to gotta explain this to you. So Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. And notice he didn't say, and they're not in, important. He just says, you're just worried and bothered by them. So many things. But only one thing is necessary. He didn't say only one thing is important. He didn't say only one thing is the big idea. He said there is only one thing necessary necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So you see, Mary has decided that she's going to want to listen to the teachings of Jesus. And hopefully by listening to the teachings of Jesus, since she's sitting at his feet, it's the type of thing that she's going to do the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that's what's necessary. Food preparation is important. 
Eating's important. The various ministries that people have are important. Jesus isn't taking away the importance of what Martha is doing. He's simply saying, Mary has one thing she's doing, which is necessary. You have something that's doing that he's not discounting as unimportant, but he's not going to say, Mary has to stop what is necessary to do something that may or may not be important. And so many times in our lives, we get so worried and anxious and try to do things and become busy that we don't do what is necessary. We wonder where God is, and yet we haven't bothered to sit at his feet. We wonder what his teachings are, but we haven't stopped to work and listen at his words. Instead, we're so busy, and oftentimes various ministers and pastors and worship leaders and Sunday school teachers and all those who are involved in various ministries can be so important and so involved and worried about their ministry that they forget what is necessary. You see, a well cannot give water unless it has water. A teacher or a pastor or a preacher cannot give that which he does not have. You must first sit at the feet of Jesus. That is what's necessary. And again, I want to say the things that you're concerned about are not necessarily unimportant. But Martha made the mistake of saying, what I'm doing is equally as important as what Mary is doing, maybe even less so. So Mary should help me rather than saying, Maybe dinner is going to be five minutes late. And we continue on in Luke chapter 11, which is interesting because the title of today's sermon is That Which is Necessary and Prayer. And oftentimes, to find out what is necessary, we need to use prayer. And so it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples to pray. Now, one of the things that we see is that one of the reasons the disciples asked Jesus to teach them is that they saw Jesus praying. One of the best ways to get people, especially in your family, to pray is to be an example of a prayer warrior, one who prays. Now, unfortunately, at least his disciples had enough sense to say, Lord, teach us to pray. And they had an example, one of Jesus' teaching, but they also said, well, John taught his disciples to pray. And apparently, Knowing Jesus as the Son of God, knowing that Jesus healed the sick, knowing that Jesus raised the dead, knowing that Jesus healed the blind and the deaf and the lame and cast out demons, his prayer life was probably pretty effective. So if you want to learn to pray, he's an excellent person to learn to pray. But unfortunately, most of us don't do that. What we do in learning to pray is we hear somebody pray that we think, oh, that sounds like a really good prayer. And we copy them. And you can also tell what denominational background a person may have just by the way they pray. And I'm not going to pick on anybody in particular, but I'm going to. And so one of the things that I hear is in a particular denomination, uh, you will hear them frequently, repeatedly say, Lord, Father, God. And I'm sure they do that because somebody they heard pray, they were very impressed with and thought that their prayer life must have been pretty great. And so they picked up Lord, Father, God, and every couple of sentences it was Lord, Father, God. We, on the other hand, we Baptists, we tend to end our prayers with in the name of Jesus, thinking that by saying in the name of Jesus is like rubbing a, a magic lamp And God's got to do something because we, after all, we said, in the name of Jesus. And so we hear these various prayers because they sound good. 
How many times have you copied what somebody prayed because they were effective? Not that they sounded good. That when somebody prayed for somebody to be healed and they were healed, I want to know that prayer. When you see that there's financial difficulty and somebody prays and suddenly they don't have financial difficulty, I want to know that prayer. I don't care how they prayed. I want to know, was it effective? And so these disciples at least have gone to the right person. And you notice they didn't say, God, look, Jesus, can we copy the way you pray? Because let's face it, they can't copy the way Jesus prays. Because he and the Father are one. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus is going to. However, he's going to teach them in a way that, quite frankly, is surprising. Now, we have grown accustomed to it because um, oftentimes we'll recite what's called the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer or various other denominations call it various other things. And we'll recite it. And um, let's face it, there are times when we recite it, there is power in that, especially when we, as a group, pray it together. But Jesus is going to, in essence, give them an outline how to pray. He's not going to say, every time you pray, repeat these words. He's going to say, here is an outline. These are the things that you should pray, and this is how to pray. And so he says, so he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is, means to sanctify, to make, and keep holy. So it, I view it as, as a twofer. One, it is an affirmation that God's name is hallowed, that God's name is holy, that God's name is sanctified, but it's also a request that God's name continue to be treated by us as hallowed, as sanctified, as holy, so that we acknowledge who it is that we're praying to. We're praying to, yes, our Father. Now, in Matthew's version, it's a little different because it starts out our Father. In Luke, it's simply Father. I don't think one is copying the other. I think Jesus, as part of his Sermon on the Mount, taught his disciples how to pray. Here he's reminding them how to pray, and he's teaching his specific disciples. And so he's using this. And so if you look at it, they're not absolutely identical, but that's not the point. The point is the bullet points. So it's Father, Daddy, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. After acknowledging that we are talking to our Father, whose name is holy, we want what's best for him first. Your kingdom come. As Jesus has said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then everything else is going to be added to you. So in Jesus' is taught a prayer, he's saying, do in prayer what I'm teaching you to do in life. Seek first the kingdom of God. So the very first request, other than maybe God continue to make your name holy, is that your kingdom come. Then he says, give us each day our daily bread. I wish he didn't teach this. I would rather he had taught, Lord, give us this day a whole year's worth. Because then I know I'm, I'm provided for all year. Now, the way I eat, I know I'm provided for all year because certainly i am got more weight than I need to. But at the same token, the prayer life isn't, Lord, make me independent of you. Lord, sustain me each and every day. So many times our prayers are, Lord, may I win the lottery. I'll even give you 90%, but, you know, the 10% I keep, you know, that's going to make me rich and it's, it's cool. And Jesus is saying, don't pray that. Pray that God provides for you each and every day. Because when God provides for you each and every day, you can thank God each and every day 
that he provided for you rather than on December 31st of each year, you say, thank you for last year. Now on January 1, give it to me again. It's each and every day. The other thing I noticed is that I was told, and I believe it true, that when someone calls you on the phone, the reason that they called you is not the first thing they say. It's usually not the second thing they say. It's usually the third thing that they say. So, for instance, somebody will call you and they say, how are you doing? They don't care. It's just polite. How are you doing? And then they may say, oh, I understand Susie uh, got an A in her science project. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, whatever. And then the third thing, can you lend me $100? That's the reason you called. You didn't call to find out how I'm doing. You didn't call to find out whether Susie did an A or not. It's the third thing that you asked for. And so, unfortunately, I think in this, it's like, okay, yeah, let's get through it. Holy be your name, and may your kingdom come. Now, God, what I really need is is food. And then, so after the prayer, the bullet point is, God provide for us each and every day. Then he says, and forgive us our sins, which is a good thing. That's a great request, because we're sinners. Saved by grace. And what people don't understand who aren't believers, they think, oh, you Christians think you're perfect. No, no, we understand we are far from perfect. As a matter of fact, the closer we seem to get to God, the further away we are acknowledge that we're from God because we see the things that we used to think were no big deal all of a sudden become a very big deal. And so it's God, Father, forgive us our sins. But nobody likes to repeat the next phrase. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now notice he said, as you forgive me, I'll forgive them. No, it's I've forgiven them, so forgive me. And it seems the hardest thing for people to do and his disciples is to forgive people. Even though you've been forgiven. We like to hold on. Well, they harmed me. They hurt me. They did all sorts of mean things to me. Tell that to Jesus. Your comparison of what they did to you ain't nothing compared to what they did to him. Quite frankly, ain't in comparison to what you've done to him. And so the statement is, forgive us, just like we've forgiven everyone else who's indebted to us. So it's acknowledgement in our prayer. And that's why Jesus will teach at other times when he says, when you go to make an offering and you realize you have something against a brother, leave the offering there and go fix it. Because your relationship to your brother is important. Because as we've learned a few uh, messages ago, you can't say you love God and hate your brother. You can't say you have a close relationship to God. That God and me are like this if your brother and you are like that. And so Jesus is saying, when you pray, ask for forgiveness, but also as you're asking forgiveness, understand that you've already forgiven those who've hurt you. And then he says something that's really, really important. And lead us not into temptation. Well, I know a lot about temptation because I can resist anything and everything except temptation. So I'm a personal expert on temptation. And I have found out that 99.9999% of the time, God never led me into temptation. I led myself. And so an example that I give, and I will give it again, As you know, one of my uh, comparisons to sin is broccoli and chocolate. Broccoli has no appeal to me. I probably should, instead of saying broccoli, I probably should say Brussels sprouts. And the reason why I probably should say Brussels sprouts is that when I've gone to the store and all the store has been decimated by people hoarding food and there's almost nothing on the shelves, there's frozen broccoli. 
Ross was frost like you wouldn't believe. I even told the manager, I go, you know, maybe you ought to learn something. That in the desperate times when people are buying absolutely everything, there's all kinds of Brussels sprouts on the shelf. Maybe you've bought too much. And so that doesn't tempt me. Chocolate does. I'm not so tempted by dark chocolate, but it'll do in effect. I like milk chocolate. I like M&M's. I like Hershey. I like um, Reese's. You name it. If it's chocolate, I love So I compare sin to chocolate because if I use actual sins, you'll think I'm talking about you or you'll think you're, I'm talking about me. And I don't want you to think in that. So we just use chocolate. And so using this as a temptation, as we go down the street, I know that there's a chocolate store. We'll say C's Candy. And I know C's Candy is on this block. Maybe I shouldn't walk down that block. That would be a good first start. But you know, being me, I walk down that block. And I go, okay, well, I'll start on the other side of the block. And then I find myself crossing the street. Then I said, well, I'll just look in the window. There's no harm in looking in the window. And I see all the chocolate. And I really love molasses chips. And I see them, and I can smell them. Well, I'll just go in the store and smell the chocolate. That can't hurt. And then I end up buying a pound of chocolate and eating it before I get home. So, one, I need to understand that oftentimes I am led into temptation by my own appetite. So don't blame God for those things. But there are also a certain sense that, well, lead us not in temptation. And I view this as kind of the conversation that God had with Satan about Job. And Satan said, well, he only blesses you because... You provide for him. You take the stuff away, and he'll curse you. God goes, okay. See, Jacob, I mean, Job has been fought, put into a position to show that he is the man of God he is. I'm not so sure I'm that strong. So God, lead me not in temptation. God, make the test. I know if you give me a test, I'm going to pass it because you know already that the test is going to be satisfied. But let's face it, I'm a chicken and I want to go through it. So lead us not in temptation. Now notice again that this is different from Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. And again, I'm emphasizing this because it isn't the prayer we pray all the time. He's teaching his disciples how to pray here are the bullet points. Acknowledge that God is who he is, that he's both Father and Holy, that he and his kingdom is what I seek first, that he will give me each day my daily bread, just as he did the manna from heaven, that I'm going to forgive, which will remind me that when I need forgiveness, I also need to forgive. And God, as you lead me, as you, the good shepherd, lead me, understand that I'm one of those sheep who tend to wander off when things get hard, so maybe not make it as hard as it ought to be until I'm a little stronger. So that's the prayer he taught. Those are the bullet points. But then he's going to say more about prayer. Verse 5, he says, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from the inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. That's a great friend. God, I have a friend. He's not you, but I have a friend. And in my culture, I need to provide for him. 
And I wasn't expecting him. He just showed up at my door. So I need to provide for him. So loan me. I'm not even asking you to give it to me. Just loan me some bread so that I might serve him, that I might be a good host. And you're my friend. I know it's midnight. It's late. You've had a hard day. You got kids. I get it. But I need the bread. Because no. Again, some great friend. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Notice, he didn't say because the hour's late. He said, even though they're friends, he didn't give it to them. Because he's friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. You see, the friend says, I need bread. Let me borrow three loaves. And the friend inside goes, ah, it's late. It's dark. The door's shut. Kids are in bed. I'm in bed. Now, the picture is, I see the guy screaming from his bed. I ain't getting up. So what does the friend do? But I need bread. I need bread. I need bread. Guess what? If I want to get some sleep tonight, I'm going to give him the bread. It's going to be less of a bother to get up into the cold of the night, find the three loaves of bread, unlock the door, make sure my kids don't wake up, give them the bread and say, get the heck out of here, shut the door and go back to bed. Then it is to keep hearing the rap on the door, get up and give me some bread. So I say to you, so Jesus has given us a little tidbit of an example, almost like a, a parable. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. You see, Jesus says, it's not necessarily the words that you use, but the persistence in the prayer. I tell people frequently, you cannot care more than the people you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do. And when it seems that you care more than the people who are trying. And so God, in essence, is saying, how much do you care? Is this really a burden to you? It's so much a burden to you that you pray, Lord, grant this. And then you go away, then maybe it wasn't that important. But if you say, Lord, grant this. And he didn't do it right away. Lord, grant this. Lord, grant this. It's teaching you to be, and Jesus is saying, be persistent in prayer. I think also that there is a, another reason that we don't necessarily see in this passage. Because there's something I've been praying for for quite a while. And God hasn't done it yet. Now the answer could be, he just doesn't want to answer my prayer. I doubt that. Because what I'm praying for, I think it's a really good reason, and it's not to be wealthy, and it's the thing I'm praying for. But I'm beginning to understand that he's not necessarily wanting that situation to change, but to change me. And by being persistent in prayer, I discover the real problem is not that, but me. And if I only give it a passing glance of concern, he doesn't teach me what I need to know. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him knocks, it will be opened. Now, lots of people love to take this out of context because they think that you can ask for anything and God will give it to you because he's, after all, the great genie. If you say in Jesus' name or all the other things, that God's got to do it because, after all, it says if you ask, if you seek, if you knock, it's going to be done to you. But notice how he follows it up. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish Will he not give him a snake instead of a fish? Will he? He's saying, okay, if your son asks for something, a fish, something to eat, 
You're not going to give him something that will harm him, will you? Or if he asks for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion, will he? Now, if my wife saw a scorpion, she'd panic. I mean, you know. And so scorpions are bad dudes and whatever. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Two things here he's teaching. Your father, whom you're asking, who you're asking, who you're knocking, who you're seeking, gives you good things. The thing that you may be asking for may not be good for you. I won't use any particular name, but there are a number of people who have in their childhood life become very famous either through singing or the movies or whatever. And because they are given this instant fame and wealth, they seem to have lives that spin out of control. Maybe having that part in the movie, maybe singing that particular song was not good for them and their lives. God knows what is good for you. And maybe what you're asking for is not good for you, though you may think it's good. But also notice he said, if your father, being evil, know how to give good gifts. Notice what he says, will not the heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Because what's the first thing we're supposed to ask for? For your kingdom to come. How does your kingdom come? By the Holy Spirit being placed in me and by the Holy Spirit empowering me and by this Holy Spirit testifying about Jesus to others. That brings about. And so if I am truly seeking his kingdom first, then his answer first is his kingdom. But all too often, we want to concentrate on the temporary. God, give me this. God, give me that. God, give me fame. God, give me wealth. God, give me friends. God, give me whatever. None of those things will last. There are a lot of people who are very important in history. If anybody learned history, they know about them. Even those famous people tend to be forgotten. The fame is fleeting. Life is fleeting. Wealth is fleeting. The Holy Spirit is eternal. Ask, seek, knock for that which lasts in eternity. So you want to know how Jesus prayed? Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I speak what you tell me to say. Father, I see what you're doing, and I do that. We want to pray like Jesus, and we need to seek the Father's business first. Because let's face it, all of us who are believers are in a family business. It's called our Father's kingdom. The great thing about our Father's kingdom is it will last forever. In business, usually what happens is the first generation builds the business. The second generation lives off the business, and the third generation causes it to be bankrupt. But in our family business, the father's business, it starts as a mustard seed, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it does not end in this life. Our father's business is about heaven, and about souls, and about who he is. Seek first his kingdom. Pray first his kingdom and all this 
will be added to you. And all God's people said,